it's kind of about taking your time and building up the fantasy. And for men, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is just to try to jump into things so quickly. I think that that's what often happens is men are just so eager to jump into sex and then ejaculate very quickly and roll over and go to sleep. This is the Bad Girls Bible Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Jameson, and this is the place where I interview experts and professionals and everyone in between to teach you how to dramatically improve your relationships and have more enjoyable sex more often. And by the way, if you want to learn my most important sex tips and techniques that will bring you and your partner back arching, spine tingling, toe curling orgasms that will keep them coming back for more, you'll find them in my discreet and private newsletter. Just go to badgirlsbible.com slash newsletter, enter your name and email address, and I will send these sex tips straight to your inbox. Today on the podcast, I'm talking to Jason Julius. He's a world-renowned sex coach and female orgasm expert. And we're going to discuss everything a man can do to give his partner more intense and satisfying pleasure inside and outside the bedroom. So if you're listening and have a male partner, you may want to get him to listen to this episode too. Jason, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I'd love um, to start out possibly if you could tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you came to teach men and women how to provide their female partner with more pleasure and have more enjoyable sex. Sure. Yeah. If you were to go back like 12 years, I would have probably been the last person that you'd expect to be talking about full body female orgasms and squirting and, you know, giving women amazing orgasms. You know, I grew up in the Midwest of the United States in in Nebraska and I was kind of uh, shy, kind of insecure when I was when I was younger. And whenever I had a girlfriend, I just really wanted to please her. Um, one of the first women that I ever really loved when I was like 18 cheated on me. And I really took that the wrong way. I really internalized that, that I was not good enough. And I kind of made it my mission that I wanted to figure this out, figure out what was wrong. What was I doing wrong? What was I not understanding? And around the age of 25, me and my best friend moved from Nebraska to Las Vegas and we started an internet business and we were putting out a lot of web properties. And one of those properties was a site that was all about dating advice. So we had all these like dating advice gurus sharing advice on our website. And during that time I was in a relationship. So I was reading all this awesome advice, but I was like, okay, I really dig the, the psychology of the male female dynamics. But the part that really stuck out to me is there was a lot of people discussing orgasms in a way that I had never heard. You know, they were talking about full body ejaculatory orgasms. They were talking about the mental side of orgasms. They were talking about all different ways to approach her in ways that I had never heard of before. So I really took to that part of our site and we were fortunate enough to kind of be at the the center of all this amazing data. So, you know, just eating it up and I was applying it to my girlfriend and I wanted to start kind of a, a, a video podcast. This is back in like 2006, 2007. And I didn't have a lot to add to the discussion about dating advice. But what I did do is I started talking about all the adventures I was having with my girlfriend as far as like, you know, teaching her how to have squirting orgasms, applying what I was learning. And soon I realized that uh, there was, you know, quite a few people out there that just, just like me didn't know about this. And so organically, I kind of just found a lot of guys, you know, you know, following my YouTube channel, just wanting to learn more. And uh, long story short, I just became obsessed with with learning more, being able to teach this stuff. And, you know, I've, I've been teaching it ever since like 2006. It's just kind of bl- blossomed from there. I think it's just more my obsession with kind of wanting to understand this so that I can feel when I've looked back, I'm like, why did I get so obsessed about this? I think it was it was was about wanting to feel like I'm enough for my partner. And I think that's you know, men and women can feel that, that sometimes they just want to be adequate. They, you know, I think it's our, our nature to want to be able to be loved. And when you feel like you're not enough, then, you know, you, you want to do something about it. Absolutely. It's, it's often, you know, there's often there's someone who's not very tall. So then they go to the gym like crazy and they want to maybe compensate in a, in a way, or just figure out a way exactly like you said, to be enough but I think there's also like, and we'll, we'll get into some of the interesting distinctions that I've kind of discovered, you know, over this past decade of teaching this, but there's 
small little tweaks that when you just apply just the smallest little difference make all the difference in the world. And I, I find that to be the case in all areas of your life, you know, whether it be your health and fitness or your relationship, just slight changes can make all the difference in the world. Hmm. Well, so I'd love then to start maybe at the start with if there's, let's say there's a, a man and a woman and the guy then he's perhaps, you know, he's trying to keep his, get his partner aroused, get her turned on. Would you have any advice for that? Yeah, absolutely. I think for the guys listening to this and for the women as well, I think that there's a huge misunderstanding about female desire and how female desire actually works. And a really good resource for people that really want to deep dive is a book called Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski. And uh, in that book, she talks about one of the big misconceptions. And this kind of goes all the way to you can kind of imagine how, you know, women are always thought to to need more foreplay. Why is that? Right. You know, for guys, we are turned on so quickly. You can kind of think of guys getting turned on like a light switch. We get turned on very visually and we get turned on, you know, if we're just, we can just get horny for no reason. And absolutely, it, it's one of those things where, you know, like we do a huge disservice trying to compare the way the standard of how men get turned on and feel desire and compare that to women. And in fact, when you actually really study it, you actually do a huge disservice just to say that there's only one way that people get turned on. But we can somewhat generalize that men and women feel desire differently. So the model that uh, Emily talks about in this book, which is really great, of desire is you can think about the way men, you know, feel desire it was sort of the standard of what people like in the early 1900s, mid 1900s thought everybody should feel desire this way. And that that is to to feel desire first, then arousal, and then that gets gets you to orgasm, right? So we can you know, be sitting in our chairs working on something and suddenly we just have this urge, you know, we kind of feel it in ourselves where we're, we're, we can be turned on very, very quickly. We can see our woman walk by. We can feel desire or I, I call that desire area like the, the turn on switch. We can feel that very easily. And then then some sexy context can come in and really get push us over the edge. She starts taking off her clothes. We start seeing her visually and we start really, you know, getting aroused and then sex begins, arousal hits a peak and then we orgasm. Well, that's the way that the majority of men experience desire and about 15% of women experience it that, that way as well. So you might, in my experience, I have dated women who do feel, you know, turned on or horny really quickly or very instantly, somewhat more how the model of desire works for men. But for the majority of women, they actually experience desire almost backwards. They need the arousal first. The arousal is like the the sexy context to mm -hmm. come first. So that's so that's what the are story. a few that's, examples? Let's just say of that sexy context. Right. That's like the story. That's the fantasy. That's the uh, her mind getting engaged. Right. So men are turned on very visually. Women are turned on mentally, and that can seem challenging for men to understand because. We expect her to get to the bedroom and just, you know, we see her naked and we're turned on. Why does she not feel the same way when she sees us strip off our clothes? It's all the stuff that comes beforehand. It's the slow, gradual buildup. I like to think of it as like a slow turn of a volume knob turned up as her mental state is able to get into the, the fantasy. as She's able to get out of her mind. So you know, as a woman, you know, takes care of herself and she's, you know, putting on makeup every day and she's really trying to present herself well to be attractive to her man visually. I think for guys, we need to understand that we need to be constantly creating and flirting with our woman to create the fantasy that she desires to get her mind engaged. So it's kind of like an ongoing thing. You know, you send her sexy text during the daytime that can be fun or or just even helping her feel like she's being seen can actually be a huge turn on, you know, like feel like you actually are seeing her for her, you know, she's, you know, busy during the, the day and she's, you know, she's got all these, you know, things built up in her head that are keeping her mind really busy and her mind needs to quiet down to get to that state of being aroused and, and into the moment and, and turned on by what's going on. Just allow her to just express, Hey, wow, you know, 
Uh, I know you got a lot going on. I can really appreciate, you know, that you do this at your job and you did this for the kids and you, you know, and just and let her be seen. And for her to feel that from her man, and she's like, wow. And then you can slowly start touch and you can and you can bring in all the senses and slowly build in a in in a fantasy. And I think there's no easy, tangible way to explain it. It's just kind of constant flirting and engaging her mind that will allow her to say, oh, wow, this this man's kind of turning me on. And, you know, she's getting that sexy context. Then desire comes in. Then that desire like, hmm, I'd like some sex comes in. It doesn't flip on instantly for her. I think you make a really good point there. I, well, two points. First, that you could almost see guys and their arousal sort of like a light switch. And then women sort of their arousal and maybe pattern of desire is more like a, a dimmer switch or a dimmer knob right. on, for lights. But and then, it's going uh, up and down all the time. It's not just like a steady up and down. It's up and down. You know, it's like <laughs> you might be doing some, you might just be lightheartedly laughing and, and having fun all day. And then, you know, you do something that really annoys her and, you know, her desire towards you kind of just dips down. But you bring up a good point, you know, like just laughing and having a good time is just like, you see on a lot of dating profiles, right? For women, like, what do they want in a man? I just want a man who makes me laugh. And that sounds like, okay, I just want a man who makes me laugh. She wants a man who makes her f like feel good feelings and really pull her into the moment. It's kind of what that kind of translates into. And it doesn't mean you have to be a jokester. It just This is it. I think, I think a lot of guys forget uh, exactly as you said, that they think what turns them on will turn their partner on. And you said like appreciation to a guy may not sound like a turn on whatsoever, but to a woman, it can be the biggest turn on being seen, being appreciated and being loved. And again, guys misinterpret exactly what you said about, you know, someone who makes me laugh doesn't mean she she wants a comedian, you know, who, who does nothing but make her laugh, but never actually makes her feel desired or sexy. Right. It's it, it engages her mind in, in things like taking control, you know, not demanding things, but like just, just taking control and, and, you know, planning the night out, say, hey, we should go check this out. Not say we have to just take control, you know, lead her through the situation, whether it be on a date or in the bedroom. It allows her to get outside of her head. She's just waiting for that guy who will just allow her to let go. And for the women listening to this, I think it can be kind of liberating when you talk about that model of desire that, you know, I think there's somewhat of an expect expectation for women to, based on the model of how men feel desire, if they're not feeling horny all the time or they're not feeling turned on, there's a lot of women who are like, maybe I'm, I'm just not as like turned on all the time like my man. And that's normal. You need a little bit of time to get into the you know, into, in, into the, the fantasy and into it. the mood, then, into the zone, into the mood. Yeah, exactly. So let's say a guy listening, he understands this, or maybe a girl listening, a female listener, hears this, she passes it on to her partner and he does this correctly, bit of flirting, takes a bit of control without kind of demanding her to do things. She's getting aroused and things are heating up. What then makes for good foreplay from a guy? Right. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's the purpose of foreplay is to build up the fantasy, because now that you understand that she needs to have a bit of sexy context first and then she really starts to feel that desire. It's kind of about taking your time and building up the fantasy. And for men, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is just to try to jump into things so quickly. I think that that's what often happens is men are just so eager to jump into sex and then ejaculate very quickly and roll over and go to sleep. And then she's left to be like, wait a second. I never even got to like my arousal to where I even was really into the sex. She really wants to be able to get to the moment. And for the guys listening to this that are like, oh my gosh, I got to take so much time every time. It's like, yeah, you, you, you need to be empathetic one of, of where she's coming from. But I think the thing is, is over time and we can get into this in a little bit once you teach her how to have like full body squirting orgasms, she may crave jumping into sex quicker. But in the beginning, particularly of your relationship, or if you're just kind of, you know, you, you've been doing the same sex for a long time, you do need to take your time. And, and I think uh, being predictable is also another thing that a lot of guys get wrong. So with 
foreplay, you want to just think of it as just building up the fantasy. Foreplay might start, you know, where you walk up behind her in you know the kitchen and be like, oh my God, I can't keep my hands off of you. And then you kind of like push her away, you know, in, in like kind of a fun flirty way. And her mind is like, what? You know, like she's starting to kind of get engaged. Then you get into the, the bedroom and you take your time with her. You, you, you kiss all the way down her body, taking your time, not just jumping into ripping off her clothes, you know, take the time to lick the, you know, lobe of her ear all the way down her neck, you know, and all the sensitive spots all the way down her body so that her mind can start to say, wow, this is some sexy context. I'm starting to feel turned on here and I want to, you know, I, I want some sex. I'm, I'm, you know, her mind, a woman's mind needs to be completely quiet in order to orgasm. And the more time we take to actually get her mind into the fantasy, into the moment, the more likely she is to, to orgasm and let go. So we, we take our time, walk, go all the way down her body. And with taking your time, it, it also comes down to if you're going to, you know, have, you know, perform oral sex or, um, stimulate her G spot, her A spot, her clitoris. You want to build up anticipation for that. You know, that for, for us guys, I think that's another counterintuitive thing. It's like, you know, once, you know, once you know, your genitals are out, you're kind of like, dude, like, I touch it's go it. Time. It's gonna, I'm going to lose my erection here. You know, like, like we're, I'm, I'm kind of like, all like, you know, go in for it. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, want you kissing around and just go, go right for the, you know, blow job or whatever. But, it's kind of counterintuitive for men because women want you to kind of, you know, lick and kiss all the way around the vulva, you know, and, and kind of make her almost just really almost wanting it so badly by the time that you actually do touch her clitoris, right? By the time you, you lick her there or you touch her with your fingers or, you know, anything, she, she practically should almost be begging for it and want it super bad because that builds it up in her mind and once it's so built up in her mind, she's so much more engaged into the moment. And that can make a, a huge difference. Um, yeah, another like you, you make a great point. Um, so, sorry to talk over you, but you make a great point of making her crave it. It's almost that you're teasing her that, you know, maybe you won't actually go further and you're going to make her, you know, beg a little bit for a little bit more. As opposed to you're going so fast that she's asking you, whoa, whoa, whoa slow down honey. It's, um, yes, exactly. and it really does come back to being empathetic about her needs and how she's experiencing this differently than you are. And I think that that is kind of a, a big flip in the mind that a lot of guys need to have is that she's experiencing this her way and you're experiencing it your way. And the more you can be empathetic about how she's experiencing it, how her desire works, how she wants you to build up this fantasy it, once you understand that, it becomes very easy to live in that world where you're constantly flirting with her. You're constantly taking your time and teasing her. You know, you're not jumping right into things and you understand that that brings her into the moment. You're not being predictable. You're you're thinking ahead of time of all the amazing things that you want to do for her next because you know that for her, that's going to be very exciting and so you're, you're not predictable. And the other thing is like in the bedroom, you need to be decisive. You need to take charge, you know, and, you know, like lead her through this situation. If she looks up to you as the, the sort of the leader of the, the situation, she's going to feel comfortable letting herself go. She's and feel it also helps her to switch off. And, um, like you said, let herself exactly. go. Yeah, exactly. Everything you can do to get her mind so present, so into the fantasy is so key and engaging all of her senses. You know, it goes it does go a long way to maybe have some music, some slow music and some candles lit. You know, you're engaging her sense of smell, her sense of, you know, her auditory where she can kind of just relax and Think about how busy our minds are. You know, our minds are just super busy throughout the day. We're, you know, engaged in our work. We're engaged in social media. We're engaged with what's going on with our family. And women are typically more likely to to, to be, you know, uh, kind of caring about what everyone else needs and, and, and giving and more giving uh, to, to whatever everyone else wants and needs. At the end of the day, it's hard for her to turn all that off and really be present for herself. 
that is just, it's just a really tough job for anybody. And when you put into that equation that her mind is such a big part of her getting to arousal, getting to desire, then, you know, you can see how important that really is to, to, to get her mind uh, present. And, you know, there, there's a lot, lots of other good foreplay things like, you know, using like dirty talk. I think, you know, a lot of guys can be a little afraid to, uh, to use dirty talk, but that is a verbal way to kind of pull her into the fantasy and make, you know, her feel the feelings of arousal. And just on the dirty talk, um, thing, I think a lot of guys and girls, they do want to talk dirty to their partner, but often they're afraid of thinking, oh my God, I have to say all these lines and all these things. And they don't realize that a moan, a groan, just a couple of four letter words is almost enough for a lot of people to really, I guess, stimulate them auditorily. And they don't have to worry about you know, almost painting this picture with words of I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this and this is how you make me feel. You don't you don't actually need that necessarily, but you may eventually get confident enough that on the fly you can start saying those things by just taking baby steps and easing yourself into it. Right. I think, yeah, you're exactly right. I think sometimes people think they have to jump in and start saying the most dirty of, of, of dirty things to their partner. It's kind of just more about an auditory way to become very uninhibited and pull, pull yourself into the moment. So, you know, when, when you're going down on your partner and you say something like your pussy tastes so good, that can reassure her that she can relax because a lot of women are very, you know, understandably, you know, they could be self-conscious about how they might taste down there. And, I love doing that with, with, with my woman and I love expressing that to her because that reassures her that she can relax, that I'm enjoying it and she can just let herself go. And that can go a long ways just in, in reassuring her. But I think that just the auditory release of how you're feeling in the moment it helps you become uninhibited too. You know, if, if you, if you're the one who starts, you're the one guiding the situation and you say, Oh my God, it feels so good to be inside of you. And she's like, Oh wow. Then she can start to vocalize how she's feeling. And then that allows her to really be drawn into the fantasy of what, what's going on. So dirty talk does not have to, to, to be anything crazy. It just is more of an expression of how you are, how you're experiencing her. And when she feels that you're vocalizing that, then she can feel comfortable letting go to say how she's feeling about you as well. And uh, a, a few rules of dirty talk is, you know, avoid using things like, you know, your vagina feels so good. You know, you kind of want to, you, you maybe need to get a little vulgar, like your pussy feels so good, you know, like, Unless that's not in your comfort zone. But I think there's there are certain levels where you kind of can use some dirtier language than you might be comfortable using outside of the bedroom that can be expressive in a way that in the context of being in the bedroom are more fitting to, you know, you know, say, you know, she's like, oh, your your cock is so hard. You know, it's just. It's like instead of her saying, "Oh, your penis is so hard," you know, like that you're almost kind of your mind. <laughs> you know, There's a stiffness kind of in your phallus. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, right. Yeah, you know, you you, you want to. Uh, I I make do sure think that... it's okay. You know, sometimes you happen to say something that ridiculous, and as long as I think you can giggle about it, and not, you know, I guess oh, not not take point. it personally yeah. that you've messed everything up. I think that goes a long way too. There's no right or wrong way to do anything in the bedroom. I think that that's, uh, yeah, you bring up such a great point, you know, with, with dirty talk, I think sometimes there's, you know, some guidelines you tell guys like maybe, you know, maybe you can maybe push yourself a little bit further than you, you might, you know, think you can just to kind of give them that little shove, but there's really no right or wrong way with, with that, or even with foreplay, you know, I think there are, maybe there are some, some bad ways of, of, of doing the same thing every time, but yeah, there's really no you're you're not going to screw things up. I think as long as you're willing to learn, you're going to and you're and you're willing to tune into what your partner wants and constantly be looking to change up what you're doing uh, based on her feedback. 
think you're setting yourself up for endless amounts of amazing, um, sexy context that you can present to her that gets her turned on. You know, you think about how many people are in a long-term relationship and the, 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 the fire is just not there anymore. Oftentimes there just was no effort typically out of not really understanding some of this context of what we're talking about, where a woman experiences desire. Men can seem so tactical that they, if they have that bit of information, they might be like, oh, I, I would have planned for that if I had known that that's what I needed to do tactically, but they assume that she's going to get turned on the way that they do. So they never ever think of it this way. Right. And so I think for the women listening to this, sometimes, you know, you can kind of give your your man maybe the benefit of the doubt that he wasn't born with an instruction book on how female desire works either. So once, you know, she learns this for herself, I think one of the best things that women can do is really learn what turns them on and they will they will get turned on so much faster, you know, because you I'm can communicate it to their partner. Sometimes they're like, well, he should just know. Well, it's like, no, he, he can't just know everything that's, you know, inside of your mind, what you want and just and vice versa. Like I, I know, you know, the, the women in my life, they don't know what I really like until I express that. And communication is, is so key to that. But once a lot of women just haven't really dialed in what really turns them on. And that exercise in and of itself, all the way from touching themselves to really understand what kind of touch they like, all the way to what really gets them mentally engaged. And I'm talking about like, you know, when you, when you, you know, for women who are really orgasmic, they, they might know that they, you know, touch their clitoris in a certain way 20 times, and then they switch it up to this. And then they think about this, like they sometimes have it so dialed into what really turns them on it's because they've taken the time to really understand themselves and i think that that can go a long long way for women to to make that a practice speaking of the clitoris do you have some advice then for guys that want to you know provide their girl their partner with clitoral stimulation um with their fingers or even you know uh, orally do you have any advice on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think of, so, you know, the, the clitoris is amazing. It's the only organ on the human body that's solely responsible. You know, it's, it's only purpose is for, for uh, sexual pleasure. And I think that that's amazing. And I think that guys really should understand that women, when they masturbate, typically stimulate their clitoris, whether that be with, you know, with their hands or with a vibrator. And, you know, there's uh, as many nerve endings, if not more in her tiny little clitoris is a man's entire penis. So that here's like a, an amazing area of her body to, to stimulate. But with that said, that many nerve endings in one spot, it should be also understood that it's very sensitive. And I think that uh, you want to make sure that you use, you know, very gentle touch with her clitoris so that you don't overstimulate it. I think that that's one thing that a, a man has to have the empathy to understand about how a woman experiences pleasure through her clitoris. One of the best ways I think to stimulate a woman's clitoris is through oral sex. And I would say with oral sex, you know, you're working your way down, you're kind of kissing all the way around. As we were talking about earlier, taking your time to where she, she knows you're going in for her clitoris. She knows that you're going to stimulate her there, but you're just taking your time until she's practically begging for it. She's just like grabbing your shoulders. You're licking all the way around her vulva, but just when she can't take it anymore, then you go in and you stimulate her clitoris. And one really great way to stimulate it with your mouth is to, I'm trying to think of the best way to articulate this. I, <laughs> I, I do this in video, so I'm trying to think of how you articulate this in words, but the way to describe how you put your mouth around her clitoris is imagine taking a bite out of an apple and you take a bite and you sink your teeth in and a little bit of the juice starts to to kind of run down your chin and you kind of make that face like, uh, you know, like you're kind of trying to catch that juice. You're kind of making that O shape with your mouth. You want to do that with your mouth and then put your mouth around her clitoris. And one of the best metaphors that I've found is to think about stimulating it, not by flicking your tongue. I think that 
flicking your tongue can be very annoying, very overwhelming for a lot of women, but a lot of men learn poorly that they should flick their tongue really hard on her clitoris because they've watched pornography and in pornography, they have to get the shot. And there's, if you were to do what I'm describing here with your mouth over the clitoris, they, they couldn't get the camera in to see it. So they started this back in like, I don't know, the seventies and eighties where the guy would just turn his head and flick his tongue on her clit so that they could, you know, see what he's doing because everything in so in it's visually is appealing yeah. in porn is what you're saying. It's visually appealing to guys. To guys, because yeah, yeah, masturbation is typically the consumer is more men. Uh, it's been more women have come into it lately, but especially back then it was mainly men. And so men got this idea: oh, I'm going to go down and I'm going to like flick my tongue really hard on her on her clitoris, and that can be overwhelming and uncomfortable. The best way to do is put your mouth around it and suck on her clitoris very gently, especially when you start. Just very gently suck on her clitoris. And this is a really weird metaphor, but you can kind of think of sucking on it like her clitoris is a small penis. And I know that uh, I because I <laughs> I had a YouTube video where I talked about this, that some guys are kind of like, wait, what? Like a penis. And the clitoris is actually just the part on a woman that corresponds with a man when there's, you know, a, a, a baby fetus has, uh, is in development, has a phallus and men and women are exactly the same in the womb when we're first developing. And then what becomes the penis becomes the clitoris on a woman. So it's the exact same part. It's the female part. It's just and developed it's just differently. It's shrunken down into that little area. So treating it that way and sucking on it very gently when, with the understanding that it's very sensitive can be super, super uh, amazing. Uh, it can be a super amazing feeling to her. And as you're doing that, you can kind of, you know, uh, you can work in your tongue. You can kind of write the alphabet on there and gently rub your tongue across it. But you don't want to slap it with your tongue. And this alone is a, probably one of the best ways to stimulate her. But a lot of women use a vibrator too. Right. And so they're used to that vibrating stimulation. So another really great way while you have the clitoris between your lips is to suck it between your lips and make like a humming noise and hum. And that humming while it's between your lips will kind of act like a vibrator. And that will really increase the sensation that she feels. Again, there's so many nerve endings right there that you can kind of emulate the feeling of a vibrator by just putting it between your lips sucking on it and humming at the same time. And that's a really awesome way to, to stimulate her to have a clitoral orgasm. That is incredible. Thanks so much for that. I think, yeah, I think a lot absolutely. of guys and girls um, can learn a lot from what you just said on how to, how to eat someone out, go down on them, give them oral sex. So I'd love to talk a little bit about the G-spot and then kind of maybe segue uh, or seg segue towards making your partner squirt but first of all how can people find the g-spot and and could you talk a little bit about why some people struggle to find it sure yeah absolutely so women are really capable of of two different types of orgasms right there we were just talking about stimulating her clitoris that's how she typically is probably used to stimulating herself uh, during masturbation and that's going to be more of like kind of a localized type of an orgasm not to discount that, that's amazing. The difficult thing about once you've given her a clitoral orgasm, it becomes very sensitive and you can't go back and stimulate it further to give her multiple orgasms. Sort of like a but, refractory period that guys have after they ejaculate? It kind of is, but it's not so much the prolactin in the brain, like the way men experience it. It's just more that it becomes so engorged with blood and so overly sensitive if you go back and you try to keep, you know, say doing that, you know, sucking and technique that we're talking about, it's almost going to be painful for her. It's going to be like, I don't want any more of that. And you're kind of like, oh, okay, well, like I, I better stop. This is uncomfortable for her. The great thing about vaginal orgasms is that women can have multiple and vaginal orgasms come from stimulating typically two different areas, her G spot or her A spot. And now that's on the inside of her vagina. And what I really like about vaginal orgasms is it gives, it gives us an opportunity uh, as guys oftentimes to give her an orgasm. That's something she's never experienced before. Something she wasn't aware of something that is more of a full body experience. 
and something that can uh, eventually lead to, to ejaculatory orgasms, which are really, really amazing. But the G-spot is definitely you know, front and center as one of the main sensitive areas of, of a, a woman's body. So to find the G-spot, it's relatively simple. Yeah, it's best explained if you imagine, this is going to be from a guy's perspective. If you imagine your woman laying on her back, you're between her legs facing her vagina and you put your hand palm up and you insert your index finger inside of her and you only go in about a knuckle and a half to two knuckles. It's not very far. And you reach inside and you press up on the front wall. That would mean like you curl your finger and you, and you press up towards the front wall. You're going to find like kind of a wrinkled or ridged area on the front wall. You're, you can kind of think of it as like if you put your tongue on, on the back of your teeth and you kind of feel that piece of skin that's like between where you're, or you can even do this with your, with your thumb. You can actually feel that little ridge that's right there where your, your front two teeth meet, your, meet the skin inside your roof of your mouth. There's like a little ridge right there. I'm doing it now. I can feel it. <laughs> yeah. Like it's going to kind of feel similar to that. But here's the thing. It may not. And that's okay. You know, like some women, their G spot is just like, well, there's your G spot. Some women, it's like, I don't know if I'm there. But that's because everyone's genitals come in different shapes and sizes, right? You know, some women, it'll just be very easy to find. Some may not. And the other thing is, is you may not find it until she's very, very aroused. And that's okay as well. So I think one of the biggest things to avoid when trying to find the G spot is being concerned about whether or not you found her G spot. I think the biggest thing to do is watch her reaction to how you're stimulating her. So with, you know, her in that position on her back with your finger inside of her and you're about, you're about two knuckles in, you're going up, you're curling your finger, you're on the front wall of her vagina. You're kind of looking around, maybe you find her G spot, maybe you don't. What you need to do is you need to do kind of like a come here type motion and glide your finger on that front wall of her vagina. And whether or not you've found the spot or not, you watch her body and how she reacts and kind of move your finger around and and watch. She'll start to kind of tense up or you'll see it in her body. She when might kind of right inhale spot. short breaths. Yeah, you, you need to be really good at her nonverbal communication. And, and if you've talked about this with her, she might say, you know, yes or no, but a lot of women don't even know where their own G spot is either. So it's best to just kind of keep doing that come here motion for a little while. And it may not even be that obvious for five minutes, but just keep doing that come here motion. And eventually her vaginal wall will start to swell up and that G spot will become more pronounced. But again, I never, I never get caught up on like, um, am I on the G spot? I'm just like, I'm stimulating this area and I'm watching her and I'm trying to figure out what she likes best because where I think the G spot should be sometimes is further back. Sometimes it's closer. Sometimes it's, I don't even ever find what is that the actual like ridged area, but it's, it's what she likes. It's, it really is about what she likes, but it is on the front wall and that area uh, is, is all sensitive all the way back, all the way from, you know, where you first insert your finger all the way back to her cervix, that whole area is very sensitive. And so I'd say don't get concerned about whether or not you're actually on her G spot. Just be concerned that her whole front wall is extremely sensitive. And if you go in there with just, just a one finger and do that come here motion and watch how she reacts, practice going all the way, all the way back and all the way forward, because all the way back, all the way just before her cervix, is her a spot and that's the vaginal fornix which is actually like the muscles that contract during an orgasm and so you're going to you're going to get a reaction when you get all the way back there you're going to get a reaction about two knuckles in and uh i think that's i think that's one of the things i want to make clear is like it, uh, some women think i don't have a g spot don't be concerned about your g spot just be concerned that the front wall is very sensitive and figure out what works for you I think so. And it goes without saying as well to guys who aren't that experienced and maybe maybe some of our female listeners as well is that you should always make sure, you know, your nails are both trimmed and filed. But oh, also, great, great so don't just um, uh, cut them, make sure you file them down, make sure there's no sharp edges. 
but also make sure that your fingers lubricate it either with your partner's own natural lubrication from a vagina or that you actually just use a, a lube, have one close by. Otherwise, you're kind of, uh, your partner is going to be in for a world of pain, which uh, you're right. You bring so up good. great points. You know, some, some guys are going to run into the obstacle of their woman being like, I don't like your fingers inside of me. And that the re- main reason is, is your hands are too rough. You know, men, you know, might have, you know, all kinds of chaos going on in their hands. They're not very well maintained and they might be very rough. The na- Yeah, you're right. The nails might be not cut. They need to be cut very short. I, I learned to play the guitar when I was younger and my guitar teacher would just get on me about keeping my nails really, really short because you, you can't fret the strings as, as easily. And so I've always been really concerned about keeping my nails very short. And that served me in, in, in those cases, because if your nails are even kind of grown out a little bit, that come here motion. It's going to scrape on a very sensitive part of her body. And she's going to be like, I don't like your fingers inside of me. I don't like this feeling. And lubricant is definitely important as well, because you might be going a long time doing this. And some guys will be like, how long will it take her to orgasm? And I guess this, maybe the simple answer to that is it could take up up to a half an hour and you never want to stimulate her past a half an hour that is a very long time to stimulate her. If she's not orgasming by then, you might just come back later and, and try it again. She'll be highly aroused. You know, the other half of getting her to orgasm is the mental side. So she might be super highly aroused. She may just not be letting go. You don't want to just keep stimulating her. You know, it feels good, but she's not letting go because she will be sore the next day. And you de- you're right. You need you definitely need some lubricant. And also, and, I think yeah. guys, some guys just have... There's, I don't know, is it ego or what it is, but they feel that, oh, I don't want to use lube because if she can't, like, I, you know, I don't want to feel like a failure. So I have to make her super wet and, you know, I can't use lube because then I'm a failure. I mean, that's ridiculous if you're a guy listening and that's how you feel. All I can say is you have to get over yourself. There's nothing wrong with using lube. Some women get incredibly wet incredibly easily and then other women don't. Other women struggle with it. And especially any woman, any of for our slightly older listeners, if you're, you know, dealing with menopause or you're postmenopausal, you're going to have a lot of women really do struggle um, at that stage to stay wet and using lube is a must. Exactly. I think my favorite is grapeseed oil. It's, it's really simple. It's cheap. It gr- makes a great massage oil. It's not good for condoms, so if you're using condoms, don't uh, use any oil-based lubricant, but there's a lot of great lubes out there, but you're right. It's not just, and and women shouldn't feel like they should have to produce enough lubricant or have the pressure on themselves because everyone's different. Every, you know, some women, you know, lubricate more than, than others. I think the idea here is just to make sure that there's no, no soreness the next day because everything feels good the day of. And I've ran into this a number of times where, yes, I'm stimulating my girlfriend. She can't get enough. She's having all these orgasms. I didn't take the time to actually use lubricant. And the next day she's like, oh my God, I'm so sore. I don't think I can have sex for like three days. You know, could just because of so much friction on the front wall of her vagina that, she, you know, she enjoyed the experience, but it in the aftermath of it, you know, you're kind of left with her being sore and you're kind of like, oh, wow, I guess we should have used some lubricant. So you don't want that regret. Absolutely. So let's say going from, you know, stimulating her G-spot, stimulating the front wall of her vagina, how can a guy make his female partner squirt or help her to experience female ejaculation? Right. So I think being in the, in those two positions, the G-spot or the A-spot are the two main areas to stimulate her to to get her to squirt. All women are capable of full body ejaculatory orgasms. And this ejaculate is built up in the skein's gland, the female prostate. And so that female prostate is actually along the front wall. And so you actually kind of start to feel it kind of swell up. But the ejaculate that we're talking about, just to be clear, comes out of her urethra, which is her pee hole. And so it comes out just like a man ejaculates and there's been studies on it where they've found that it's just prosthetic fluid, just like there 
what would come out of the male prostate. It's uh, very natural. It is not pee, but sometimes women experience the feeling just before to feel kind of like they need to pee. Naturally, but, because it comes out the same. Yeah, shoot. it comes out the same same place. So you're going to run into a lot of resistance for her letting go. But we'll get to that in a second. But the two areas you want to stimulate are her G spot or her A spot. And again, I, th I feel like it's not really about getting caught up on am I on her G spot or her A spot. Again, her A spot is the rim that goes all the way around her cervix is really sensitive. You don't want to touch her cervix because that can be kind of uncomfortable if you're poking and prodding at her cervix. Her cervix, for guys who don't know, is if you put your finger all the way inside of her or your penis, it kind of feels like the tip of a nose. It kind of feels like hard cartilage. And you don't really want to be poking and prodding at that. But that rim that's all the way around there and the, particularly the front wall that's just before it is extremely sensitive. And that's why I, you know, I was saying earlier, like, don't get caught up on whether or not you're on her G spot or her A spot. Stimulating her front wall with a simple come here motion is a very great way to just get to know where exactly she responds and watch how she responds. But as she starts to build up towards that orgasm, you're going to feel that front wall of her vagina begin to swell up. It's going to begin to balloon out. And for women who are highly ejaculatory, it'll balloon up really fast and it'll actually push your fingers out of her right before she ejaculates. So it'll be very obvious when she's going to ejaculate. But for women who have never ejaculated, Again, a lot of women have never had a vaginal orgasm. So sometimes our goal is first to give her a vaginal orgasm to get her to let go and have this amazing full body kind of experience before she even gets to the point of letting go. But once you've gotten her there, you've gotten her to have that orgasm, then you can help her kind of let go. And that's that's where I say like, you know, women will experience the feeling of needing to pee. So a lot of times they'll hold back. And they'll, they'll, you know, like experience about half the orgasm because they're, they're like, oh, my God, I don't want to wet the bed. And uh, understandably so. That can be a very huge mental block. And so I think it goes a long way for a guy to help his female partner understand that when she's at that point that you'll you'll feel the vaginal wall swell up around your fingers and her, see her orgasm if you don't see the ejaculate come out. Uh, you can ask her if she feels like she needs to pee afterwards. Oftentimes they like almost run to the bathroom because they have to pee because the it's it's like a retrograde ejaculation. It goes back up into the bladder instead of coming coming out. And at that point, from a guy's perspective, you can just remind her that, hey, I, I, I love that you had that awesome orgasm during that time. I want you to just push out. I want you to just let go. And you might find some resistance because she might think that that's dirty or she might pee on you. But it, it goes a long ways to help her understand that that is ejaculatory fluid that's wanting to come out. And it's very, very natural. And every woman can squirt. Just a lot of them are afraid to. And once they're able to let go, then they can experience an orgasm that's so much bigger and so much more explosive than if they were to hold back and kind of clamp off their, their PC muscle. That's awesome. That's that's really great, Jason. Um, then I'm I'm just wondering one question on that that I I actually personally get emailed a lot about is anyone can search on any porn site squirting orgasm and you'll see a video or videos of women that seem to have water pistols coming out between their legs and shooting fluid across the room. Is that what happens every single time when someone has a squirting orgasm, or is there sort of a whole host of different things that can happen. I think it's more the a whole host of things that can happen. Uh, I think the the big thing to 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 watch out for when you actually try to watch porn and try to associate that to reality is context. Realize that these people are actors, they're being paid. If she doesn't squirt, she's not getting paid, right? She gets paid a certain amount because she can squirt. Uh, there's been many cases where the ejaculate is not even real. Sometimes you actually watch it and it's actually just coming out of her vaginal canal, not her actual urethra. I think there is more and more real squirting in, in pornography and also keep in context just the way that they pick the men with the 0.1% biggest penises. They also pick the women who can 
have the most crazy ejaculatory squirting orgasms, you know, so context is really key, right? But it, what you actually will see sometimes is just uh, a lot of times in the beginning, maybe just a small trickle. Sometimes it might be more like, you know, if you imagine the the pulses of ejaculation when a man ejaculates, oftentimes you'll see that out of out of out of the woman. And and to be clear, it's usually it's a clear fluid. It's not, you know, it it so sometimes it can be misconstrued as as urine, but it's not. And some women just absolutely gush a lot and soak you and soak the bed. And now that might to some people be like, oh my God, I don't want to soak the bed. And I think that there's plenty of things that you can do. It's like, it's like a quality problem to have where you're, if you're, if you're concerned about you're soaking the bed too much, you're kind of ahead of a lot of, a lot of women or, or a lot of couples, you know, where, you know, you've got your body dialed in. Yeah. There's blankets for that. There's blankets that make for easy cleanup. So don't allow that to create any sort of mental block that you're going to soak the bed and make a mess. It's the most beautiful thing in the world when a woman is on top of you and she ejaculates and it comes out on top of you. I I don't know. As a man, I think that there's almost nothing more gratifying than knowing that she's experiencing the fullness of her orgasmic ability right there while you're inside of her. Oftentimes you're not inside of her because it's another thing too, when you're having sex and she's about to uh, ejaculate, you'll feel her, her vaginal wall come down so quick and hard that it will actually push you out of her. And then she'll kind of like kind of explode. And then a few seconds later, you you can reenter her and keep going. And as I was mentioning earlier, the amazing thing about vaginal orgasms is she can have one after another, after another, and she can squirt many times in a night. And that can be really fulfilling. It can be from a guy's perspective and, and from having the empathy of, of wanting her to have the best experience. It, it can really be amazing. Awesome. So you talked a little bit about how guys need to understand that if they're simulating her vagina for 30 minutes or maybe an hour or longer, that they're going to kind of go from the point of providing her with pleasure to actually possibly providing her with a bit of pain and soreness. So I'm wondering for the guys that are listening that deal with delayed ejaculation, so sort of like the opposite to premature ejaculation, is there any advice you have um, for couples, for guys to deal with that, to sort of get, you know, to have some control over um, how long they last and not last so long, I guess. Yes, you actually bring up an interesting point. You're talking about guys who have a difficult time ejaculating during sex. Yeah, so it's sort of like a guy who thinks he's a hero the first time he has sex with this problem and he's like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm, I'm some sort of um, genius. But he doesn't realize perhaps that his partner, after a certain amount of time, she may start, you know, feeling it as kind of painful penetration but additionally, she may feel that she's sort of like a failure that she hasn't, which is a sad, a sad kind of attitude to have, that she hasn't fulfilled her part of the deal, which is ridiculous. But I, know, I know exactly what you're talking about. And first of all, ladies, it is not your fault. It is a byproduct of our our modern world. And I find myself having done this for over a decade. This was never something 10 years ago that I heard that much about. But I have a huge part of my group of guys on you know my YouTube channel and my newsletter who are constantly writing in saying that they're having a hard time ejaculating and you're starting to even see about see more about this in mainstream culture and I was listening to a podcast with uh, I think it was Tim Ferriss was interviewing a prostitute uh, from Nevada yeah, she was like the, the sex worker one. called Alice Little yeah who coincidentally and, and, I'm actually I think I'm interviewing her on Monday <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, ask her. Yeah, she can probably explain it from a woman's perspective way, way more. But like she mentioned that this has even become a problem, you know, in in her industry that men have a diff- difficult time ejaculating, particularly probably with a condom on because you can't feel as much. And a lot of it comes down to conditioning and desensitizing yourself because never in, in human history have we confronted a time where 
we have accessibility to pornography and so much uh, choice and option to what now I never want to say like like masturbation is comp- you know I, masturbation is very healthy I don't I don't want to like put any false beliefs in anyone's head but we've come to a point where you can just switch from scene to scene to scene of the most extreme pornography that you could ever imagine and men can condition themselves with the tight grip of their hand or any kind any number of different sex toys that don't feel the same as sex and what the brain does is it just you know it puts new grooves in the brain right so you imagine like a ski slope going down there's fresh powder and then you know people go over the same grooves over and over eventually you kind of have to follow those grooves that's the way the brain works and what you've done over and over and over again is what your brain requires, right? And so men who watch even a fair amount of pornography and then eject, you know, they masturbate and ejaculate using their hand, oftentimes condition themselves unknowingly in a, in a poor way that requires too much mental stimulation and a different type of physical stimulation. And so the best thing that, and this is why I brought up that podcast, is she said that men should actually all own a, Fleshlight, I think it was like the fleshlight with the least amount of like like grooves and different uh, stimulators inside. It was like the, the the most plain one that you can get because it it more simulates the inside of a vagina. And mas- if you if you are going to masturbate, masturbate with that. And I don't remember she talked much about pornography, but from my perspective, I think that men need a vacation from pornography because the mental side of things. It, it, it just it's just too much. You can switch between so many different scenes and that's not realistic to what sex is like in the actual bedroom. And, you know, I think we just live in this modern time where we have to be really be conscious of this. And women sometimes have the same thing with, with their vibrator. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a vibrator. However, too much reliance upon that intensity of stimulation. I, I talked about that, you know, sucking technique earlier, but it, it can't quite get to the level of like an ultra fast vibration of a, of a vibrator and that type of stimulation. And sometimes a vacation from the, the vibrator will allow a woman to become more sensitive to vaginal stimulation. So I think it kind of goes for both sexes that we need to just be cautious about what we do, you know, when we're stimulating ourselves so that we're not overstimulating ourselves to the point where actual sex itself just doesn't feel as good. I think that's a, a great point. I, I get emailed about it a lot. And one of the pieces of advice I give, I get emailed by um, female readers of the site. And the piece of advice I give is just ask your man to stop watching porn and stop masturbating for two weeks or at least a month. And you'll notice that he actually wants to have sex a whole lot more, but also that he's a lot more sensitive. Because I think you end up you end up becoming... As a guy, I think you sort of become the LeBron James of getting yourself off, which is very different to how your partner would do it. So I think they don't kind of know your grooves, as you said yourself. So what about then in the opposite situation when a guy suffers from premature ejaculation? Is there anything he can do to last longer? Uh, Number one thing is to exercise your PC muscle. And that brings up another good point. This relates to both men and women. For the women who want to learn how to squirt, there's nothing more important than strengthening your PC muscles. So men and women, one of the best things they can do for their sexual health is strengthening their PC muscle because a strong PC muscle is very important for women to be able to experience ejaculatory orgasms. And that is something that, you know, as guys, we can recommend to our woman but, you know, for women who just take charge and, and do that for themselves, they experience way more intense orgasms and actually feel tighter to their partner. And for men doing PC muscles exercises allows them to last longer in a counterintuitive way to where most guys have a very weak PC muscle because as, as you were saying, like there's two different sides to this. A lot of men have premature ejaculation, but then now there's this new you know, problem of men ha- not being able to ejaculate. But the, the men who have premature ejaculation, oftentimes when they're masturbating, they do it as quickly as possible because they're just trying to get the deed done. But what that does is it puts that in of itself as poor conditioning because it conditions your 
physiology and your mind to just ejaculate as fast as possible. And so those grooves, the, the ski slope I was talking about earlier, your mind has the grooves to just ejaculate very quickly. But when you strengthen your PC muscle, one of the great things about doing that is, first of all, by ejaculating quickly, you weaken it. But you have to do the exercises to actually strengthen it. But when you're actually having sex, you have to relax your PC muscle to be able to last and to be able to control your ejaculation. But if it's weak, you can't actually relax it. You actually have to have a strong PC muscle in order to be able to relax it. So it's kind of, it's, I guess, maybe counterintuitive. Like, you know, a lot of guys are like, I'm strengthening this thing. What do I do? Squeeze down before I need to ejaculate. And the actual answer is no, you need to actually relax your PC muscle, but you can't do that until you actually strengthen it. Awesome. Jason, this has been fantastic having you on the show. I'm just wondering. Oh, thanks. Where can people find you? And maybe could you tell people a little bit about your infamous instructional video for guys to learn how to help their partner experience female ejaculation? Yeah, like I said, I've been doing this for over 10 years. And one of the best resources that I've put out there is on my site, orgasmarts.com, where I have a video tutorial that shows how to stimulate a woman's G-spot and give her a squirting orgasm. All my stuff is non-pornographic. There's no nudity. It's it's all educational. And that's one of the things that I feel like I've been able to reach a larger audience because there's, you know, people don't necessarily feel like they're on a pornographic site. They feel like they were actually learning. And I think that that means a lot to a lot of people. And I do have a YouTube channel also. It's if you look on YouTube for Jason Julius, I have a YouTube channel as well. Awesome. I'll include those two links to your site and to your YouTube channel in the show notes. Jason, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, man. And by the way, if you want to learn my most important sex tips and techniques that will bring you and your partner back arching, spine tingling, toe curling orgasms that will keep them coming back for more, you'll find them in my discreet and private newsletter. Just go to badgirlsbible.com slash newsletter, enter your name and email address, and I will send these sex tips straight to your inbox. 